Welcome back, folks, to the conversation series on Get a Grip on Lighting. Today's show is hosted by Henrik Clausen. That's right. And his guest today is Christopher Kit Cuddle. Before we get to that conversation, which usually surrounds the purpose of light, it's deeper meanings with, Hen- with Henrik, we've got to talk about our friends over at Keystone Technologies. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com because they make light easy, Greg Eric. That's right. And they also make seeing their booths at conventions easy and fun. I was just at Light Fair and they had one of the well, most attended booths there. People surrounded all over the place. Great staff, product. They had demonstrations, shows. Everything you need, everything you expect out of a good lighting company, Keystone does, and they came through with it at Light Fair, and they continue to come through with it outside of Light Fair. Doesn't you don't have to see it in person; you just have to get their stuff, use it, keep it, keep it easy with KeystoneTech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, and of course, proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. We're getting together. Be there or be square, sucker. September thirteenth through sixteenth at the Dallas Market Center. Hooking up with ArcLight, go to NAILD.org, baby. But for right now, let's get it on. Henrik and Christopher, enjoy. Well, it's been a while since we've met, Kit, and I'm so grateful that you had taken the time to participate in this episode of Get a Grip on Lighting, the conversation series that I've been giving the privilege to host. And you are one of the people I've always enjoyed talking to. And it's funny because it's been so... Ever since the first time we met, we didn't need sort of a warm up. It was just you are so easy to talk to. So it's been it's been my pleasure all the time. And I would really like to touch on your life with lighting because you've been there for a very long time. And I think it was in Copenhagen you received the award from PLDC Professional Lighting Design Association at the conference for a long life contribution to the lighting industry. Do you remember that? Oh, my goodness, do I remember it. Uh, Just to give you a little bit of the background, um, I arrived at the conference. I wasn't feeling very well. And um, I I met, um, oh, my goodness, uh, name, 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 name. Probably Alison. Yes, in actual fact, the, the man. Uh, so th- this was um, oh golly, 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 gosh! Why do why do I have so much difficulty remembering names? Um, <laughs> anyway, he I met yeah. him and um, he uh, he took my wife aside and he was concerned because nobody had told me that I was lined up for this to receive this award, and he wanted to make sure that I would be attending the the dinner, and uh, she. Uh, complied with all of this and it is absolutely true i was sitting there in the uh, at the dinner i had no idea this was happening until it was announced at the time it was just a shock out of the blue to me but, but what did it, what does it mean to you to get this recognition for a lifetime award it means it wasn't anything particular it must have been a long haul you've been through could you th- Think and reflect on that, please. Well, look, it has been. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny because I think so many people who uh, get into lighting arrive there by accident. Um, nobody goes to their school counsellor or advisor and they're told, lighting. Lighting is the thing for you. It's a it's a strange one, and I do seem to f- I do find now um, when I'm talking to people and I say yes, so actually I, I work in lighting, I get a rather blank look coming back. I mean, you know, there's a switch by the door. You turn it on when you want it. You turn it off when you don't. How can a person spend their life studying that? Um, and um, it really is uh, a thing that uh, there are people who get quite passionate about lighting. And um, one of the little uh, things that uh, sort of uh, anecdotes I like to remember is that lighting doesn't just make things visible. Lighting changes the appearance of everything we see. And um, when one gets that, um, other people don't notice it. You know, human vision evolved so that people could recognize things, objects, and surrounds, not so that they could see lighting. You have to learn to see lighting. But once you've yes. learned to see it, oh my goodness, 
It's just so, such a powerful medium uh, for influencing people's, uh, the appearance of people's surroundings. But, but who got you into lighting? How did you start? You didn't get it from school, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. No, in actual fact, um, <clears throat> it's, it's the people who, who really made it. I, I joined uh, originally a London uh, company uh, simply because, okay, I had done uh, two years of national service uh, in the British Army. That we was, there was still conscription in those days. Uh, and um, I didn't feel in a mood to get into full-time education. I wanted to earn a bit of money and have a bit of life. And this company offered me uh, a, a, a full-time job with release, for a time release to go to technical college. And I got myself qualified in electrical engineering and illumination engineering and I would they also they signed me up to join the illuminating engineering society of Great Britain this is in London and I started going to meetings and realizing that there are people who really are fascinated by light and lighting one person who really had caught my attention was a young architect before well, he was young then uh, called Derek Phillips and he had a successful architecture practice but he was building up Britain's first architectural lighting consultancy practice he had one uh, fellow John Howard working for him and I became the second one DPA lighting uh, is now an international uh, lighting consultancy practices wins international awards but that's where it all started Derek was an enthusiast and then I moved from there to join the Pilkington Glass Daylight Advisory Service and the manager was one John Lines John Lines, uh, he was a fascinating character, really so interested. And he introduced me to the concept of the illumination vector. And I spent all oh, uh, the next three decades uh, working with that concept. It was just, uh, just fascinating. And it was these enthusiasts, these people with insight who really uh, captured my attention and got me involved. Do you think we still have these people around? Because I'm... <clears throat> My start was pretty much the same. I was an electrical engineer. I started working from Louis Paulson, who did the decorative fixtures, but the light didn't come out the way the architects and the lighting designers wanted them to. So I put illuminating engineering into these lighting. And I was probably the first guy who actually did something like that. Before that, the fixtures just looked stunningly beautiful, but nobody cared about how the light came out of them. So it's it's actually a very nice and a very nice, but I've never gotten along to daylight. I think it's extremely complex. I think the electric lighting is much easier. Well, I I would have to say that I, I agree with you about all of that. Um, but I do see some really uh, interesting developments uh, occurring. That is to say that uh, daylighting in the in the literature still tends to be locked back in the old days of uh, you know providing a unif uh, providing uh, da the daylight factor over the horizontal yeah. working plane and the space and so forth. But um, there are some people. But one particular person who captures my attention is John Medeljevic. Uh, John uh, is, uh, of course, in the UK, and he's been coming up with, I think, some concepts, some aspects of uh, evaluating uh, evaluating the effect of windows in spaces, uh, thinking, of, so looking at them both as means of providing light, but also as communicators with the outside and how they, they influence uh, people's whole attitudes. Um, that really has been um, has been has been interesting to catch. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's amazing because we work. I work with a doctor at the uh, university in Copenhagen uh, who has at a at the master degree in uh, and a doctor degree in uh, Scandinavian light openings. Do you know the way you frame the window shape? Sort of, it's not just the hole; it's actually the inside of the window that distributes, or the frame that distributes the illumination out into the rest of the space. And it's utterly fascinating that you can you can use such much time. And she's so good at this; it's just it's just an amazing area of knowledge but it seems it's very very specialized very often that you focus on one little thing 
Well, look, I do agree with you because really when I take a trip down into the, into our, uh, uh, the central business district of our town and I see these uh, office buildings all extensively glazed and yet every window has got a blind down over it. Um, mm. There's something gone oh, gone completely awry here uh, that the way the buildings are being designed and built is just at odds with what the users of the building actually want uh, are, are wanting. Um, there is a, a real mismatch at this point. Yeah, I, I need to I need to go to your now. Well, I'm. I've warmed up for this, but you know I'm a huge fan of this light field theory. And when I was preparing for this conversation, I thought about it. Maybe it's because I myself am an electrical engineer, and I'm used to working with electric field, gravity field, magnetic fields. And when we talk lighting, we always use vector mechanics and dynamics and calculate that. And then suddenly you came oh. up with the idea that light was a field just like a um, gravitational field or electric field. Could you tell the people who are listening to us now what what the how you come about that idea? Because I think you were the first one who ever scratched that surface. Well, I'm not too sure. Um, actually, I was quite fascinated a little while ago to come across the, the the concept that Robert Faraday, who was the father of electromagnetism, um, he saw lighting, a light apparently, to be a field uh, uh, a field phenomenon uh, like uh, the magnetic fields he was working with, and it was John Lines, the character I just mentioned to you, who put me onto a uh, an, a paper a doc. A doc Document produced by Alexei Gershon in 1936. He published is this uh, document, The Light Field. Now, the okay. mathematics he uses is pretty advanced stuff, but he, with a question, um, understood this whole concept of, uh, of of light fields, and when you start thinking about it in these terms, and you see, when I started, when I got into uh, teaching, uh, and initially it was teaching the lighting technology, but I gradually migrated across to teaching lighting design. And this created some difficulties for me because the lighting technology is not at all well related to what lighting designers are, are, seeking, are seeking to do. And it's when you start to think in terms of light field and you realize that lighting designers are creating light fields. Um, this is the uh, the uh, this this idea uh, that the come comes through that yes it is a full three dimensional light field that lighting design by which lighting designers envision uh, the uh, the visual effects that they're going to that are going to be created and once you catch on to that then um, seeing the way. Uh, that uh, people have uh, people think in term uh, think in this terms is the key to relating lighting technology to the process of lighting design, yeah. and this is the way around it should be. It's not that lighting design has to adapt itself to lighting technology. The lighting technology has to serve the process of design. But when there are two things in this, the first thing I want to I want to go on if you could help. We have a lot of people listening who probably do a lot of light, who does a lot of light planning, because I try to differentiate between light planning, calculating how many fixtures we need to get a certain illumination level, and then lighting design, who is more like in the artistic part of it. Because we as manufacturers, we do light planning. We tell people, okay, in this building you need 1,500 luminaires, and they need so many lumens. And what you are doing here is trying to get the best of both worlds together, I think. But could you help people who, I guess the vast majority of our guests here are people who do light planning with dialogues, relux or whatever. So could you tell them mm -hmm. your thoughts, what, what the light field actually does for us or how it really, how it's applicable? 
Well, I have always had, had a good involvement with the practicalities of lighting and uh, what, what goes on. I haven't, although I've been in academia for quite a while, I've always kept alive uh, the uh, business of working as a lighting uh, consultant and uh, getting involved in design. And there is a very real issue here. That, that, that is that uh, so often you are working on, uh, you've got this space uh, which a developer has put up. The de developer has no idea who's going to be using this space or how it's going to be used, but nonetheless it has to be lit. And um, with that situation, uh, what can you do? You can just provide uniform illumination through it so that when somebody holds a light meter out about waist high, uh, the, a number pops up on, the, uh, pops up on their meter um, and uh, the illumination is adequate. But it is, it is not until the place is being planned for use for applications and uh, people are getting involved in the whole of the interior design of the space that the lighting design um, can, can be applied. And um, I wish, in fact, I just wish massively uh, that uh, when the developers put up their buildings, they would leave the floors uncovered, they would leave the walls and ceilings unpainted, uh, they would have, uh, uh, and basically the whole of the space uh, can be then fitted out uh, for its, uh, its use, and the lighting can be designed along with all of the other aspects of the interior of the space uh, that, are, that, that are needed to make it work. The best opportunities that occur for lighting design, in my opinion, usually occur when uh, people are retrofitting or refitting a space. And this is coming about quite often simply because um, people realize that uh, now that uh, LEDs so hugely reduce their operating costs of lighting um, that uh, they want to they, they want to, uh, they, they want to update uh, their lighting installation uh, with modern lighting equipment this is usually the best opportunity to apply lighting design but when you when you want to apply and you use your your theory what is the, dif the biggest difference between that and doing a light planning? Because we need to show people that they have enough light and they use need 15 fixtures or whatever. Could you help us in that direction? Okay. The whole business by which people, um, by which uh, this lighting, lighting is controlled, regulated and operated, just by uh, people... The people who write the, uh, the, co the codes and the lighting standards always uh, just feel in despair because they write these quite elaborate documents and the people who use them don't read the words. They just go straight to the schedule of illuminances, look up the number as the, the number of, of uh, lux that they have to apply uniformly over the horizontal work uh, over the, uh, in the space. And although it's called task illuminance, they don't know what the tasks are or where they're going to be. Uh, so they assume that it is uniformly distributed over the horizontal, horizontal working plane. This, in fact, um, is uh, the, the, this. What we really need to do is to step back and realize and, and accept that what we would, what what we are. Uh, I beg your pardon. I'm getting confused. What we, in fact, <laughs> are providing is a lighting distribution that has been developed for a particular application, and that is an application of where visual uh, the work that people are doing is either on a a desktop or a bench top, and these desktops and bench tops are uniformly distributed throughout the space. And this, of course, is the way uh, that most uh, a lot of workspaces were set up in the first half of the last century. Since then, an awful lot has changed. You're quite difficult to find places uh, where that are that are set up like that. But nonetheless, the lighting solution that is almost universally applied is a solution that was developed for that particular lighting application. And we need to recognize that this application does not exist much in workplaces and certainly not when we apply the same lighting metrics for lighting, oh, 
shopping malls, uh, 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 reception foyers, uh, just circulation spaces, transport terminals. Um, no, uh, this, is, this is a totally inappropriate distribution of light that we are thinking of applying. We need to be able to step back and think now every space, uh, indoor space that we provide lighting for, we need to create a luminous environment for people. And we need to think, first of all, in terms of the ambient lighting effects. Measuring ambient illuminance uh, is, 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 is what we really need to do. And there's some very interesting developments occurring now in uh, lighting, uh, lighting meters, uh, light meters that I, I think is uh, going to trend, uh, has the potential to transform how we measure, how we specify, and how we predict lighting. But we need to start off with the ambient lighting effect and then consider now how does the lighting, the direct light we apply in the space that is going to generate this ambient lighting, how is that to be applied in order to be able to respond to the potentials, the opportunities of this application? Is that because we world we experience the world in the in the vertical plane in the ambience? Is that how we as people experience a space much more than the horizontal? Well, I do have to agree with you. Um, <clears throat> I think the, um, I feel almost despair every time I get one of these uh, new updated lighting guides coming through and I see a diagram of uh, a person on a, a very modern bod uh, body support system sitting at a desk uh, with a field of view that is limited to a computer screen in front of them. And we are supposed to believe that people inside buildings spend their lives like this. Um, this is not <laughs> this no. is not how people spend their lives. Um, just get around and just see how people actually live, live inside inside buildings. And uh, this notion that we have fixed set fields of view uh, within which uh, within which we apply lighting is altogether altogether misplaced. Um, I, I really do feel very def very definitely that um, the um, the whole approach to lighting was developed from looking for the detail, getting the details sorted out, and mm. then thinking how you apply the surround to that. This is a, a totally misplaced uh, placed approach. Start with getting the ambient effect right. Everyone has a surrounding luminous environment that, that they need to adjust to, adapt to, to orientate themselves to. And the light there has all kinds of effects, particularly for people who are spending long times in these spaces. We're learning more and more about how people's uh, sl uh, wake sleep cycles, how people's alertness levels and so forth are influenced by the uh, these ambient effects, the effects of the surrounding environment. And this is what we should be concentrating on, uh, uh, how we create this to be suitable and uh, well, 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 uh, well organized uh, for people who are perhaps spending long hours in the place, perhaps just parting through as a transitory thing uh, between one space and another. Always, these are the contexts that one has to be has to put people uh, people into, and getting away from this idea of people being sedentary, people having fixed fields of view, and we design uh, we design our lighting for that but Keith, if we if we say that at least the pandemic has teached us that we can work everywhere we can work in the cars <laughs> and we can work <laughs> at, the, at the kitchen but when we go to the office in the future i think we go there to meet each other what are the requirements that we need to think about when we are illuminating people who are having a dialogue so that i can actually present my great idea to you and I can look at you to see if you like it or if you're just being a polite British gentleman who says this is very nice but you don't really mean it because I believe I'm a firm believer that we will meet in the office to share ideas and to grow in groups and it's a complete different light set than do a visual task on a computer or anything else I think 
What are you taking? Oh take my goodness! That? Look, I, 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 I just, I just, I just do, do respond so well to to what you say. Um, I spent quite a while, in actual fact, uh, examining this whole business of uh, the light field and the illumination vector and looking at how lighting affects those terms modeling that people like to use about mm. how lighting influences the appearance of three dimensional objects. And the exactly. object that I chose to concentrate upon was, in fact, the human features, because this is a thing that matters so much to us, how we interact with, 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 with people. Um, you know, one, of the, one, one example that hits me again and again, you arrive at a hotel and beautifully positioned right in front of you is the reception desk. Behind it are the very nicely dressed and well turned out receptionist. And the lighting is hideous. There is down lighting, putting in a high level of illumination onto the counter in front of these people as if detailed visual work on small on on difficult difficult detail there there really matters and this lighting is creating a situation where it throws their eyes into shadow nose shadows running down over their chins and oh my goodness i have to say anyone who is unfortunate any uh, of us males who are unfortunate enough to have uh, lo lost our hair early in life we have a little line of bright dots scattered right across our skulls, uh, which is just so unattractive. I get that. So, uh, so you we need to do we need, for we need, we need and for interaction, we need a, I think. We do need, uh, for human features, we need, a, it is a diffused light, but it is still directional. And the ideal direction is from the side as you're looking towards the object, down an altitude of, oh, 15 to 45 degrees for the flow of light across the features, off to one, one side. This is what really looks good. And this, of course, is why, you know, we enjoy often meeting people out of doors in daylight and so forth, because people look so nice there. Um, yes. And yet we then move indoors and we create some absolutely horrible lighting conditions for um, meeting people and viewing the human features. When you people set up a meeting room, what do they do? They light the tabletop. They do it again and again, you see it. Recessed lighting bashed down on the tabletop. And this is how they light a meeting room. Mm -hmm. You're right. Um, I need to share a story with you because I had just a master student going up for her exam and she was talking about lighting, creating atmosphere in spaces and doing her presentation to, to me and to the, uh, the examiner beside me. She talked about immersive experiences. She said that if you're sucked up in water, you're immersed by water, you can be immersed by sound and you can also be immersed by light, that you are completely in that and when you look at something, it's the visual impression of a statue, a painting that comes through your receptional system. But that would be another way of creating atmosphere than being immersed in the light. And I thought it was so fascinating. And when she said that, I thought of you and thought some of the things you've said about the field, that you are immersed in that light field. You're not just being illuminated. You get my well, drift. Look, it's, it's, could you, I you think do about get, I do get that. I, I do get that. And I think that's a lovely concept. I, I, it, it is when I find myself in contact with people, uh, people uh, like this, like that, who really are seeing the light, looking for, uh, looking for, not, you see, um, one of the areas I've done quite a bit of work in is lighting of uh, art galleries and museums. It's been, it has been a particular interest of mine. And I've been to a number of times where we, I've been involved in setting up um, uh, an exhibition uh, and getting, getting involved with the lighting. And go along to the opening night and just listening to people uh, they are what they're saying. Now, nobody is saying, oh, what beautiful lighting. Oh, the lighting here is lovely. No, no one is saying that. But no. if they are saying, 
my goodness, this, this, this work is really coming through to me. Then the lighting's right. The lighting's doing its job. And it takes yeah. a lighting person to see the lighting. It's our job to see the lighting. And uh, the fact that other people don't see it, don't understand it, don't notice it, is but just part of what we work with. Do you think it can influence us as um, this term atmosphere? I understand it's really, it's for me, it was very hard to grasp because I'm coming from a technical background and I could say, okay, it's humidity, it's uh, air temperature, it's lighting, but it's, it's being immersed and that what creates an atmosphere. You create atmospheres, I guess, in a gallery, in a museum. And and how do you how do you sort of think when you make sure that people are immersed and can experience this place in um, as good a way as possible? I don't know really how to say it because it's it's really tough for me to 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 get to get uh, formulated because it's I think it's such a well, groundbreaking thing talking about atmosphere in lighting. I, I do agree with you. And, you know, one, one, when I first started getting really interested in uh, museum and art gallery lighting, it was when I was sort of really involved in daylighting, because there is a school of thoughts that in order to really see and appreciate artworks, you need to see it in natural light. And, of course, the conservators get very worried and concerned about this because it's so difficult to control it and to control the light exposure that light-sensitive objects are being exposed to and so forth. So there's a, a big field to this. And, um, and there, there was the people, one of the uh, lighting techniques that was uh, being uh, promoted strongly and was being taken up by a number of institutions was that you uh, each, uh, each work of a work of art and particular painting and particular paintings um, has its own projector which is a framing projector which is a fo focused onto the artwork then the framing is cut off so that just the uh, the the artwork itself is illum illuminated and the rest of the space is uh, allowed to just pick up the reflected reflected light uh, light from that and the conservators loved it because they could control the uh, exposure of their these objects absolutely and precisely and of course when you walk into the space the sp the artworks themselves sort of glow at you off the wall and it's totally artificial appearance it's as if they appear as if they are sort of backlit transparencies they are not really um it's not paint on canvas it, it, it's 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 they say they look as if they're self-luminous and the, experiencing this uh, really brought home to me the important importance of seeing these works in a, the in an ambient light in a luminous environment in a setting that enables you to assess and realize things in relation to their surroundings. And in actual fact, I really have been uh, so keen always to uh, get away where if you've got uh, half a dozen paintings hanging on a wall you just wash that wall with light but i don't mind building up the light level higher um, at the around the height that the works are and letting it fall away around a bit just to give that little that bit of emphasis but as soon as you start really just thinking oh people are here to see the paintings so this is what we are we like this is what we show them no with they need to be able to experience those paintings in context in a surrounding and if i imagine you and i standing looking at the same painting i would probably look at the painting and then i would look at you to see how you feel about the painting so i need the uh, ambient lighting to illuminate you i guess I think I think you I think you absolutely yes you have you have to be right. In actual fact, one of the really nice kinds of galleries, the lovely ones to, to deal with, are sculpture galleries, because these are objects where, generally speaking, conservation is not a problem. And you absolutely right. are lighting for three-dimensional objects. And if the you light it so that in fact the sculptures look good people are also going to look good as they're walking That's in a good point. the place.
That's a very good point. Yeah. I haven't thought about that, but that that almost has to be like that. Mm. Do I I need to take you back to Faraday and Earth uh, and these people who worked with the um, the equations on mathematics for electric fields and gravitational fields and that. We all know that if we move a wire through a magnetic field, it would generate electricity, right? But what yes, happens indeed. when we move? a person or an object or something through a lighting field, what does that generate? Oh my goodness, Henrik. You really uh that 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 is but a it very must good it must question. you know it must That's have an effect it, somehow. Well it should the, the the idea of there being a dynamic effect of people moving through a light field is 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 a lovely concept. I I I really don't, I I have to admit that I I have worked with some very good mathematicians, so good that I realize I am not one of them. Um, and these people are some people who really can cope with the full three-dimensionality of uh, field theory uh, and uh, make it makes sense uh, make sense to them. Uh, I struggle at that level i fully i fully admit but the way that the light field makes a lot of sense to me is that if you just take the, the point that in uh, an enclosed space in an indoor space unless it total darkness there is no unlit location within that space there's no way position where you move things through to and they just vanish because there's no light there the light diffuses right through the space every space every 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 every, every, every part every part of it is uh, part of it is lit and once you uh, fill in and you start building up on that that notion, then you create a situation in which yes, there are there is variation, there is a, a change uh, change change uh, change within the space, and that's uh, but you can separate now the whole the total three dimensionality of 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 space full of light into two fields a direct field and an indirect field now we'll stay with electric lighting now because as you we've agreed this is the simple way to, way to deal with things <laughs> the flow of light from luminaires to their point of interception on a room surface or one of the objects within the room occurs mm -hmm. without visual effect the direct light field has no visual effect. It is not until the light's undergone its first reflection that it has a visual effect. And then the indirect flux field is the sum of that first reflected flux and all of the flux that is gen generated by multiple interreflections until that flux is totally absorbed. That accounts entirely for the visual, uh, everything we see, our whole visual experience of the space. Now, this, to my mind, is rather fascinating. The actual visual experience that we are trying to develop is due to this indirect light field, but the field that generates it is a field that is has no direct is well. If I call it an invisible field, I think you, you follow what I you follow what I mean. Yeah, I follow this is you. what we. This is what we. This is what we in fact put into the space. This is what we control. But it, it, is it has so no direct visual effect. It's visual. The visual effect is due to the indirect flux field that it generates. But, it, but if you if you hold okay. a metal ball, if you hold a metal ball in a magnetic field, you can't see anything. It just influences the magnetic ball, something or the the iron ball that you are holding in your hand. If you hold it still. Nothing happens. If you have a wire in there, you move it in the magnetic field, it generates electricity, hence heat. So there's always something that movement generates. And I think that's so fascinating. So I was wondering, what is it that we move through through light to? Is it is it ourselves? Is it um, the objects we are looking at? Is it, 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 there must be something because they are so much alike. 
these gravitational field, electric field, magnetic field and light field. You know, talking to you uh, sort of sets, sets me in motion again. Uh, I, I need to work more or more with this. It's a thing that uh, it's been around in the back of my head for a, a, a long time, but just recently yeah. it's been coming, coming, up to the, uh, coming up to the fore again. Uh, talking to you about this is, 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 is lovely. Uh, the business of um, the effect of movement within uh, the, the whole of the fields, uh, fields that we work with. Golly gosh, the, uh, I'm thinking now about some of those um, exhibitions that uh, you know, I've, been, I've been involved in. Um, the actual movement of people, the interaction of, pe of, 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 of people has, has, been, been, has, been, has been there, but the actual works of people that people are coming to see are static. Mm. And um, what an, an amazing situation it would be if, in fact, we introduced movement there. Um, that, uh, particularly for sculptures, that is to say, that you create a uh, you create a light field and you move your objects within the light field, so that you have dynamic changing effects. The sort of effects that you have to generate by yourself walking around the object, you would find that this was occurring all yeah. around you because the objects themselves were in motion. What an amazing thought that would be for, for, uh, for yeah, a sculptor it, exhibition. It is about the observer effect. Like, you know, when you go in and say, as soon as we observe it, we influence an effect. When I look out at your window behind you, the tree is moving in a light field out there and it generates things that we perceive as beauty. People ask for lighting that is not static. An architect told me many years ago, it's like the world stopped rotating, it gets boring. We need to have these moving, the sun need to move, the clouds, the trees. So it's a, it's a wrongdoing that lighting is static. It has to be moving fluent like water all the time. And, and that's, that's this field, I think it's not a static field, it's probably variating, at least outside. I know we talked only about electric lighting, but we have an idea of breaking everything up, breaking the movement up so that we hit the brakes, nothing happens, we have a static field, we are happy now, 500 locks on the desk, all that stuff, and it's, it's just so wrong. Because we are moving in there and, and it should be moving in a in a way I can't describe because I've never really seen it. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is a lovely conversation. Uh, you, you, you're you setting my mind, mind, uh, mind, mind running. Uh, gosh, you need that. The, 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 <laughs> Just see, seeing, of course, and of course, appreciating that um, what we take in through our eyes is only just part of what we, exp uh, what our total experience of uh, of of, of, spa of space is, and uh, just uh, how one could work uh, all of the all of the the, the dynamics of that, um, you know. Um, we do, of course, when we uh, create indoor spaces, we do uh, make so many things static, non-moving, uh, sta stable, uh, and we are depriving people of um, stimulus uh, the, the whole time. Uh, why do we feel so good when we've had uh, been out for a, a, an hour's walk exactly. on a bright, sunny day? Uh, it is not just because we were moving, it is because everything else around around us was moving um and um uh, the the this these these cha change changing things um it's it it does it uh, it enlivens one makes one makes makes one uh, makes one feel 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 good uh, stimulates uh, the, the 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 senses and we deprive people of so much of that with the controlled uh, air conditioned environments uh, that we put them into yeah you know, um, well, I I need to tell you a thing between us because my colleagues at the university is nagging me because I don't have a PhD. And they uh, say to me, but uh, you should get one. And I said, no, 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 I'm way too old. And every time I say that, you are being dragged out of the box. But Kit could do it. Yes. 
Is that so? Oh my goodness. Yes, it is so. Well, let me so you're the reason. <laughs> All right. Well, just very briefly, Henrik, uh, Henrik I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, tell you what, uh, what, what went on there. Um, I retired in 2007. And I knew there was unfinished business. There was, uh, I, there was, I'd been working on things, and I hadn't drawn things up to a head to a conclusion. And I, things I absolutely, absolutely wanted to get done. And so I got down to some writing, and I had a paper published in Lighting Research and Technology in 2010. Soon after that, one Dr. Kevin Kelly from uh, the uh, uh, Dublin Institute of Technology got in touch with me. He had a bright young student who was looking for a PhD uh, topic. They had both read uh, my paper and thought it could be suitable. Would I be interested in getting involved? Oh, my goodness, yes. And um, this guy, uh, James Duff, yes, uh, I got I, I got in, I, I really got involved. Uh, he came up with a very good uh, PhD, uh, graduated in 2016. On the strength of that, uh, Kevin managed to get a, a follow-on, uh, Antonello Durante, who is also uh, working working it through. And we were sometimes getting, in, getting involved with this, and he, uh, Kevin said to me, you know, here you are. You are advising PhD candidates, but you don't have a PhD yourself. You really ought to think about it. And so far, we we worked we worked for this, and he, in fact, set me up. Um, and yes, uh, just uh, what's it? Three years ago now, uh, mm. I. In the full regalia, with you know the floppy velvet hat and all those all those gold braids, <laughs> went into St it. Patrick's St Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, and uh, where I, I graduated, and I was eighty years old. And uh, the uh, vice chancellor, in uh, giving the talk. He made some play on this uh, before I was called up to, to receive it, and I got a wonderful reception as I turned around and walked and came came down. So if you are able to experience anything like what I experienced at that time, Henry, just go for it. Now, it was a wonderful time for me, and I I, I just really really got such a, such a lot of pleasure out of it. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think it's so fulfilling to know that you did that and to see that age doesn't matter. It's. Uh, I know it's a fluffy thing, and we always say that when we get old. And when I say, "Oh, now I'm past sixty, and and I know I have twenty years before I need to do my PhD," that's nice. So I have uh, I have a buffer there, but I think it was an amazing yeah. achievement that you did. So um, I want to wish you congratulations I... with that one more time. Yeah. Actually, it's five years ago, not three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for thank you for saying that. But uh, I have to say thanks to Kevin Kelly. He was the guy who really set me up for that. But but could you sh could you share with people who haven't read it what what was it about? Could you give us a, an outline of what you what you did? Well, what really it uh, it came down down to was a PhD by publication. Um, of course, I had to come up with uh, a whole, uh, quite a, a good few thousand words uh, explaining uh, the continuity and how it all fitted and how and, 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 and how how it, how, it, how it all went together and making a proper story out of it, um, and uh, the whole lot with uh, uh, a few uh, some some of my papers um, made the the thesis, but. Uh, the uh, the examining committee. Um, oh my goodness! They 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 put me through the mill all rightly. Um, <laughs> I had uh, I, I had it uh, via, via an internet link, uh, three and a th quarter hours of examination uh, as they they go, going through, and yes, they seem to be satisfied that I had made a contribution to uh, current knowledge that was sufficient to justify awarding that degree, and that was uh, really quite a quite a thing. What was what was the title? The title. Do you know? Honestly, I have to go and look it up. I can't remember no, no, exactly. It's okay. now. <laughs> but we need, we, need to, we need to know that you don't have to. We need to know where we can find it because I would really love to read it once. I've, I haven't read it. My my mistake, but it could be fun. 
All right then. Well, I've got to go to. I could go to another room now, and I could uh, uh, get it and uh, read it, read it out to, uh, read it out to you. Uh, alternatively, I mean, I could certainly send you a, a, a reference, uh, a reference to uh, to it if that if we'll, that would meet your we'll, requirements. Yeah, it could be super cool. We'll find it and put it in some in some of the notes here when we do our when we do our podcast. So, uh, so what do you think is the next big thing that we should do in the uh, in the lighting industry overall. What should we dive into now? We had circadian lighting, human centric lighting. What, what should we actually say? This would be great. All right. The thing I've the, the, the stuff I've come up with, the material I've come up with uh, lately. I've had some enthusiastic lighting designers who've taken it up. Uh, some have even to, uh, make it uh, using it throughout their practice. Uh, that has all worked. That works out extremely well, and I get good feedback from them. So the whole thing has been developing, and it goes well. But the great bulk of everyday lighting practice, of course, is governed by lighting standards. And the uh, and while that while that happens, and while everybody knows that. Uh, if you're going to light a given space, you've got to provide so many lux on the horizontal working plane. While that is in place, there's really no opportunity for any kind of worthwhile development or, cha or change, uh, change to occur. And this is very concerning because whereas... Um, when lighting codes and standards are updated, uh, people are looking for uh, uh, incremental changes they can make mm. uh, so that each uh, rec recurring addition is an update on the previous. I'm talking about something quite different. I'm talking about no. We're not looking for incremental change. We're looking for t casting out all of the stuff that we've been doing and doing something different doing it differently and that is not at all popular it doesn't go down at all no. well with the people who do the right the regulations and, uh, the, and 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 govern practice and um just how we ever are going to make a breakthrough there i don't know it's it's a matter we're talking now not about technology we're talking about politics really um yeah. and if uh you anyone has a suggestion I would just be. I would just love to love to hear it. But yeah. it's a, this, as I see it, is the real problem: being able to get to a situation where we make a a paradigm shift. In actual fact, I joined with um, th uh, three other academics just a little while ago. We uh, published what we called a manifesto. Uh, this occurs in the uh, the news the. Uh, uh, light lines, which is the bi-monthly newsletter for the Society of Light and Lighting in in the U UK, and um, you know the response is, was really very very predictable. Um, the designers said, "Yes, this be, this would be wonderful," uh, and the no, no, we don't need another metric. We don't need new that no, traditional way of measuring. Um, we can't, you know, we, we've uh, all this practice has developed over more than a century of progress. Uh, we can't possibly just this, suppose that we throw all that away. The, oh. And um, there it is. I know, so, I know you've been fighting, Kit. And I know, and I've always been supporting you. And what I try to say when every people talk to me about standards, I say they are fine, but it's minimum requirement. It's like a safety belt in a car. It's something you need a lot of more to get comfort, to get an economic right, to do all the other things. It's just one parameter. It's minimum requirements. <sighs> In a way, I mean, I do recognize we'd have to have standards. Uh, they, they, we, uh, we, we do have to make sure that, you know, we provide uh, places that are safe. Uh, we uh, meet up uh, with just fundamental requirements of uh, enabling, uh, enabling people to be able to go about their business and go about their, 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 their functions uh, with a sufficient and adequ adequate illumination. What I'd really like to see was the standards comes down to very concise documents, which set out uh, this 
is what you have to have to uh, they specify uh, that these are the conditions that you must provide. This is how yeah. you predict it, and this is how you measure it. And then authorities can say, and furthermore, we are going to enforce it. And that simple, straightforward, forward. Uh, set out in that form so that uh, if anybody fails to provide that, well, basically they're providing something that is inadequate or even potentially dangerous, you know, they're, they're just at, that kind of, at that kind of level. But then that we make standards achieve lighting quality by adding chapters of uh, discussive material to, to them. Um, this, that, that's, that is not the right way to go about it. Uh, you cannot prescribe lighting quality quality without knowing what is the situation, the circumstance you're fitting it into, and what, in fact, is the purpose that lighting is to to serve in that application. And as soon as we get down to uh, people uh, supposing uh, that they can do this, what they're, in fact, doing is trying to uh, impose standard solutions. And this is uh, an aspect, uh, this is a, a, a way of regulating lighting that I feel, feel strongly opposed to. This is the, absolutely not the way to go. No. Yeah, but, I, but I think what you and your fellow academics have done is, is, is like raising, you've, you've been very good at telling people what you think about it and the rest of us has to shape up now because we are, we are, doing big, big steps on so many levels in so many other things, but lighting looks pretty much like when I started and probably also pretty much like when you started. We have innovative light sources with good control systems, but the the philosophy and the, the ideas about what lighting can achieve is still lacking behind. And I, I'm, I'm, the, I think uh, you've... The, the... I was just, just for, for, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you know, no, the... Fine. The research that the lighting industry has put into the development of light sources and controls uh, over the last two or three decades has been remarkable, and the transformation in lighting equipment has been has been absolutely tr- absolutely tremendous. But um, it has not really advanced lighting practice. I mean, it's made it more efficient, and it's made, you know all all that kind of thing. But actual yeah. lighting practice hasn't really ad- really advanced. And although um, people are still publishing some good research, and uh, this comes out in the, in the journals and the academics uh, and some of the advanced practitioners do, act- do actually read it, it does not enter general lighting practice. It doesn't no. change the thinking, the mindset at all. And um, I, the thing that I like about uh, trying to, uh, the approach that I, I want to take of whenever there is a lighting uh, job that is being, or project that is being considered, the first thing to do is to devise what are the lighting design objectives specific to that application. And once people, we get people who are doing the everyday task of organizing lighting for spaces, we get people doing that. Then the development of research becomes interesting news of uh, what's Mm. going on in the world of lighting. And people are able to incorporate this then into thinking about the lighting design objectives for these uh, four specific applications. I think it does have the opportunity to completely transform um, light, uh, form the whole way, uh, the whole of of lighting practice. I do find it a very, a very what well, exciting pros, prospect. But the awful thing that stands in the way is the oh, the mountain of um, background material that nobody wants to change. I think um, I think this wraps up what we've been talking about, Kid. You've had a long life. I've had a not so long life in in lighting. We've done what we can to do something and we hope that the lighting designers that we put out of school every year will take small steps and we will get there. So I thank you so much for your contribution. You really deserve the life of the lifelong award. It's super cool to talk to you. I hope we can meet in person again if I come 
to New Zealand again, like we did last time. And you're always welcome in Scandinavia with us. So thank you very much for participating. Henrik, this has been a real pleasure for me. It's so much uh, seldom I get the opportunity to have an in-depth discussion of this sort with uh, a, a real lighting enthusiast. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Whoa, we got to keep it easy, Greg, as always. We go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Light made easy. Color selectable, lumen selectable, and just about every ob fixture option they have now. Uh, they also have all the tube options you'd expect, any size, length, wattage, color, everything Keystone's got. Check them out. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. That's right, KeystoneTech.com. And, of course, National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Um, NAILD.org, our convention's coming up September 13th through 16th at the Dallas Market Center. That's right, September 13th through 16th. Check it out at NAILD.org. Bye for now.